All right. We are into it, everybody. We are getting into it. I hope the audio is uh, is okay. Um, I tried to increase the 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 recording level uh, of the audio itself. I'm not sure uh, if uh, if it's coming through a little bit louder than it normally is or not. I uh, I tried to do my best on that. Uh, trying to improve some lighting conditions uh, and spruce up the old background. Uh, found some old pieces of art uh, that uh, most of them most of them are done by me, um, except for the flowers. Uh, those are not done by me, uh, and neither are these plants. <laughs> these are not my plants. <laughs> I know a lot of people have commented about them, uh, and I, and today, as you can see, I'm not wearing my robe. Uh, it's because it guys, it's just getting hot. That's a thick robe. Uh, as much as I love it, and it's super, super comfortable. That's a that's a thick robe, you guys. Uh, not not the smartest decision on my part. Um, got laid out pretty heavily yesterday uh, to do a quick check-in at the top of the video here. Laid out pretty heavily with a with an intense migraine. Um, took a few hours for it to to settle, which I guess is lucky because I think the last time I got a real heavy migraine. Like that one, uh, it, I was I was out for like a whole day. It was like a pretty intense stress migraine uh, that I got. <laughs> that that kind of that kind of crushed me and like laid my ass out for a while. Um, so uh, yeah, I was I was kind of not able to do as much as I normally would have, uh, or or the things that I uh, wanted to do, wanted to get done. So I uh, had a bit of a bit of a later start to my day, playing a little bit of catch up today. Uh, but that's okay. We we got we got back into it. I have my water. I have my emergency uh, that my friend Cat sent to me. So I'm drinking that. I think it's like raspberry flavored or something. Uh, pretty good. Pretty solid. Getting my vitamin C and uh, trying to stay healthy uh, throughout these this situation. So uh, let's get into it. We we are we are doing the uh, the old philosophy Fridays. We're back into philosophy Fridays, and we're going to be talking about strikes, uh, as is the theme for the week. <laughs> the theme for the week is strikes, and that's that's kind of what we're talking about. So um, we have been talking about these strikes all week. And uh, I think that they are pretty important. Um, there, there are some strikes going on right now. Uh, I think I just saw something that McDonald's workers are going on strike. Amazon, um, I talked about the Amazon strike, the Whole Foods strike. Um, the, what was the other one that I, oh, the Pittsburgh sanitation strike that started last week. So we got some strikes going on. And, uh, and the hope is, I think with the way things are going, uh, we might see a general strike. I did address the fact that we might also end up seeing a healthcare strike. Um, that's some recaps of, of some of the videos earlier this week that you can check out on this channel um, if you miss them. Um, and one of the things I did address was the 1919 Seattle general strike. Um, and we're going to pick up, pick up from there um, and go and talk about some other general strikes um, and just the idea of whether... These strikes work? Are, are they are they efficient? You know, are, are we wasting our time here? You know, are, are these should we even be doing them? Is there a different method of, um, you know, achieving change, achieving uh, the goals of the working class, and so on and so forth? Right. So um, let's start. Let's start with 1919. Uh, we're going to talk about the 1919 Winnipeg general strike, which occurred a few months uh, after the 1919 Seattle uh, general strike, right? So a little, a little um, quick recap of what happened in Seattle in 1919. Basically, uh, the, the shipyard workers were uh, promised by the government that if they work for um, lower wages to help the war effort, that they will be compensated fairly and better uh, you know, after the war in 1919. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the union tried to negotiate, the workers tried to negotiate with the, uh, the, the managers and the bosses, and they basically said no. So they decided to strike. And uh, right, right as the strike started, um, they also looked to pretty much every other union, every other 
worker in the city of Seattle and said, hey, can you join with us? Can you come and, and, and strike in solidarity with us? And then that's what happened. So, and so that was the first general strike where 65,000 people said that they were just not going to show up to work. Uh, people started freaking out. This was right at the heels of the Bolshevik Revolution. So everybody was like, oh, my God, is this communism? The, commun the communists are here, guys. They're fucking here. How did they even make it? How did this, I did this ideology get a passport to, to get into the country even? Who's, I mean, what are we doing about ideological immigration? Have we even thought about putting this down for democracy? You know? So, uh, so there was a six, it was a six day strike. Um, and here's the thing none of the strikers were violent. They actually used some older striker, uh, older labor organizers and the veterans that were out of work to, um, to help corral the strikers. Uh, there was a lot of community community driven efforts uh, like dine ins. Uh, people were, you know, taking oil to hospitals. They were collecting people's garbage. A lot of these community efforts were being driven uh, by people that were striking, by people that were organizing. So uh, there was a there was a solid effort behind it. And that's when um, you had, uh, you know, the, like. The city government was freaking out. Ole Hansen was the mayor, uh, basically thought that this was going to lead into a violent revolution. So like uh, like the National Guard was called, the army was called. They were, you know, uh, so then they started arresting stri uh, the strike leaders. Uh, they just started arresting them. Um, and that's when morale dipped because all of the leaders and the organizers were being arrested uh, on false charges. Um, and, you know, uh, so basically people kind of, disbanded the strike from there after six days right and and really <laughs> the only points of violence came from Ole Hansen who was saying that he's going to you know fight back against the, the the communists trying to take away our democracy by basking for fair wages and treatment for the employees right so uh so that so it was that and then but like the strikers never got violent um which is what they what what you know the the claim was that's why we need all these cops out here we need all these army people out here um it was pretty peaceful it was a community led effort um so but it was the first general strike uh that uh, that we had ever seen um so there were some kinks that needed to be worked out nobody knew exactly how they were going to um, disband them. Now, there's a lot more detail uh, in the last video that I did uh, specifically in regards to the 1919 Seattle general strike uh, that you can go check out. There was whispers and rumors of assassinations and things of that sort. Um, but it was a six-day strike. Now, at the same time, a few months later, in, in Winnipeg, which is in Canada, if you are not familiar with anything outside the United States and think that the whole world revolves around the United States, much like most of the people in Galileo's time thought that the whole universe revolved around the planet Earth, and then they were proven wrong, much like the people in the United States in five years will be proven wrong that nothing revolves around the United States and that the United States has falsely made a gravitational pull around itself by eating too much McDonald's. But anyway, uh, that's, not, that's not the point of this video. <laughs> Um, the 1919 Winnipeg general strike uh, started just a few months after that, right? So the Seattle general strike happened uh, February, January, February, and this starts happening in the spring, uh, April, May is when is when this start ha this starts happening. So once again, after World War II, Canadian employees uh, were were basically uh, thrown to the wolves, right? The employers were making uh, quite a bit of money. They were they were reaping the benefits of the war. And um, unemployment was at a at an all time high. Vets who served couldn't get a job. Uh, housing and foods costs were rising uh, and a lot of immigrant workers uh, were living in less than perfect conditions. OK, now. You got to think about it this way, right? <laughs> this is when the immigrant scapegoat argument is used. When people are suffering 
when when citizens are not doing well because you know you have a bunch of like wall street fat cats that are making a shit ton of money that you know it's like the banks are getting bailed out over the american populace because of a fake economy that needs to be ran instead of the real economy that's run by small businesses is run by the people uh, it's always well the immigrants well they came in here and they stole the economy that's what they did okay that's what that's what they always do they come in and they steal some of the economy and then they just send it overseas by mail. So we got to stop them from doing that. Ban immigrants from going to the post office. They always, they always scapegoat the immigrants whenever, but the, but the blamers are the ones that are creating these worst conditions. So, so the question really should be whenever that stuff happens, whenever people start scapegoating immigrants, is the person putting the blame on the immigrants, what are they doing to improve the life of the worker? What are they doing to make your life better as the worker? Um, ask yourself that question, which most people don't. <laughs> so at the heels of this, this all comes at the heels of the uh, uh, 1917 Russian Revolution, with, which was like a people's revolution. Um, and everybody kind of freaked out and said that, you know, the, oh, my God, this is so this is communism. Communism is coming to him uh, to to America, to Canada, you know, and, and what are we going to do? This is going to be the downfall of democracy. They're, they're going to they're gonna take over and, and, and help people. This is crazy. Everybody should be in competition with each other. If the working class isn't trying to murder itself on a constant basis, that's not democracy. That's, that's communism, which is also not communism. Uh... <laughs> But there was also this thing called um, syndicalism that was growing. This, this idea of syndicalism was also growing. And that was a term that I had never heard before. So, I, uh, so here, here's a definition of syndicalism. Uh, it is an international attempt to organize all workers into unions and worker councils. The goal of syndicalism was to bring down capitalism and give workers the means of production. To achieve this, it supported actions such as general strikes. The movements were the movement was active in the first half of the 20th century. Okay, so that's what syndicalism is. It's it's an international movement um, to to help uh, you know workers seize the means of their own production. Um, and and there was a lot of people in Canada also calling for one big union. They wanted one big union to represent all workers instead of just smaller unions that are you know that represent its particular you know. Uh, little factions like shipyard workers or iron workers or whatever. Like you could still have them, but they would be under the conglomerate of one big union that kind of standardized the, the work conditions for everybody. That was kind of the, the idea behind uh, what was what was being um, what was being said at that time, right? Uh, which you can also make the make the correlation that like that's kind of what the democratic socialist movement is all about too is is that they want, you know, this one big union idea of like, okay, people should be taken care of in this particular manner. People should be doing, you know, we, we should be granting people health care. We shouldn't be trying to put a, a, a literal price tag on the human body, right? Like, we, we shouldn't be doing that sort of stuff. We should be helping people. We should be, uh, that should just be an intrinsic quality that we shouldn't try to make a profit off of. Like, the, like the setting these sort of bigger general rules. Um, so in May of 1919, in May of 1919, the building and metal workers uh, tried to negotiate with their employers. That was a no-go. Pr pretty much uh, the the bosses, uh, a, you know, of the building and metal workers were just like, fuck off. We're not going to, why, w get out of here. You know, you want these handouts, you know, these handouts for the jobs that you're doing, you should just be happy that you're working. Okay, that's basically how they um, handle that situation. Uh, and uh, the Winnipeg Trades and Labor Council, in sympathy, uh, in sympathy and solidarity uh, for the metal workers and building workers, said general strike. We need to do a general strike to make sure that the conditions of all of the employees uh, all of the workers um, gets met. You know, we so 30,000 workers left their jobs. Now, this is slightly less than the Seattle um, Seattle general strike because the Seattle general strike was 65,000 people. 
more people for less time. Um, the Winnipeg one lasted about six weeks, so less people, more time. Um, and uh, so, so once again, th this was not just the metal. This was everybody, right? Like the whole the whole city essentially was was taken down. Uh, you had blue collar manufacturing workers, you had white collar workers, you had police, firefighters, bankers, postal workers, basically everybody that you would consider an essential worker was was going to strike at this point. Like they just wouldn't wouldn't be uh, doing, you know, the, the quote unquote job. So this was organized by the Central Strike Committee. Uh, they were nonviolent. They they wanted civil discussions for better pay and better work conditions. Once again, these are not. I, I, I keep reiterating this because there's a lot of these um, like anti-strikers, you know, why can't these people be happy with what they have kind of thing. But this is not really like asking for anything crazy, you know, like we're not asking for gold toilets in every cubicle here. We're literally asking for uh, better work conditions, better pay, more, more fair pay, by the way, is is like considering the the rate of inflation right especially in 1919 after the war the housing costs and food costs were going up but the pay wasn't going up people were working 12 hours people were um you know uh, some of them weren't even getting jobs they were just kind of suffering um and couldn't do anything or they were or they were getting paid very little to do all these jobs so so this now you know was was somebody that was advocating uh for the worker Right. Because this is something that we've said before is there is no one at the negotiating table in terms of Congress or um, in terms of any of the stuff uh, that represents the worker. Right. Like like these 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 closed door meetings that happen where it's Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and, you know, Joe Biden and, and Trump and all these people. And they sit around and just smoke their cigars and like they're, we're not represented in that room. All of these people are like millionaires and billionaires that essentially are like, hey, how do we, you know, enrich ourselves even further than what we already have kind of thing. But nobody's sitting there and saying, well, how do we take care of the American worker? What do the workers need? How can they be taken care of? And that's what the unions are doing. That's what the Central Strike Committee essentially was going to do, was bringing, bringing the workers' voice to the negotiating table so that we were actually represented in some of the laws and the bills that are being put into place. Now, there was an opposition. Uh, there was an opposition. It was called the Citizens Committee. It was made of a 1,000 people. Uh, and it was like manufacturers, bankers, politicians, so on and so forth, right? Mostly, I'm, I'm guessing the manufacturers were not like manufacturing employees. They were more um, probably like, um, uh, I'm losing the words here. Sorry. Sorry for my brain fart. Uh, they were probably like the bosses, like the manufacturing bosses that were involved. So... You know, this is also a thousand versus thirty thousand people that wanted this, right? That thirty thousand people that came out and said, "We don't support what the bosses are doing. We don't support these conditions." Um, versus thousand people that were like, "This is communism," like the you know. So the citizens committee. Uh, the opposition community called them uh, called it Bolshevism. They said that this was organized by enemy aliens. Ooh, the aliens are coming down, you guys. They're here. Oh, no. So scary. Uh, so these xenophobic attacks levied towards immigrants is what they were trying to do. Once again, that scapegoat comes in, right? They're, they're, trying, to, they're trying to be like, if it, wait, the, the pure, poor Canadians are being, they're being taken advantage of by these aliens that are coming in here and they're and they're 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 seizing the means of production <laughs> these aliens they're 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 asking for 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 more respect for the work how dare you how the, the your respect is is give, given to you in little little morsels by by the by the bourgeoisie and and that and that's how it's got to be okay that's what that's that's how are we supposed to do? we're not good at manufacturing as 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 these politicians that make laws we're we're not good at, at fetching food I, I, I don't even know how to make toast unless unless some, some lowly 
immigrant worker makes it for me. How dare you? How dare you ask me to respect that immigrant worker? So, uh, so they refused to meet with the Central Strike Committee, right? The Central Strike Committee was like, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what these workers are looking for. Let's talk about how to, like, what our demands are and how we can meet them. Refused to meet them. They basically said that at this point they could deport um, any British immigrant if they wanted to under sedition. So within two weeks, um, the central, the citizen committee resorted to violence, uh, unprovoked, unprovoked violence, right? They called these people specials, um, and they would ride around on horses with bats and conduct night raids, uh, and then eventually. Ten leaders of the uh, Central Strike Committee and two leaders of the One Big Union, they did make a One Big Union, were arrested by the government. Um, and so on June 17th, they got arrested. On June 21st, uh, there was a silent parade held by the strikers in solidarity um, of their leaders. Right. So this was a silent strike. It was a silent parade and they marched. And uh, they marched down Winnipeg, and then the police attacked the strikers. And eventually, there was a, a streetcar pushed over. So here's, here's an image of that. So this is what happened, right? They eventually, after they were provoked, uh, the, the strikers pushed over the streetcar. Uh, two protesters were killed, and 30 people were injured. 30 people were injured. I mean, that, that's kind of crazy that, like, a whole streetcar just got pushed over. Um, but here's the thing is, like they were just silently marching until the police decided to uh, to attack them. Um, and this wasn't just the police, right? It was a combined effort of the police, the army, and the specials. Uh, they beat these nonviolent protesters that were standing in solidarity for the illegal arrest of their strike leaders, asking to be who were asking to, to be treated humanely at work and compensated fairly. That's what was going on. That's the little daisy chain. <laughs> Right. Like the strike leaders were like, let's meet up and talk about how we can treat each other with respect. Let's let's meet up and talk about how we can be compensated fairly. They get arrested just for saying that. Um, and then, you know, there was a nonviolent parade that led to uh, the police, the army and the specials beating the shit out of nonviolent protesters who then retaliated. Uh, and through that retaliation, a, a streetcar was uh, tipped over. Two people died. Um and 30 people were injured. So the moral is, if you want to value the intrinsic nature of just humanity in and of itself, uh, the power, the powers that be uh, will, will beat the shit out of you. Uh, why? Because uh, democracy. That's, that's how you save democracy, is, uh, is by, uh, by beating people uh, asking to be treated fairly. Let that be a lesson. <laughs> Look, the best authority, the best, blah, the best authoritarians are the ones that come wearing the face of democracy itself, right? Those are the best ones. The the wolves in voters' clothing, the wolves that come out and they say that we're standing. You know, we're standing by you. We, we believe in you. And then they go and they legislate on behalf of, uh, of, of just corporations, of the bosses. They don't give a shit about you. And even when you just come up and be like, can we just talk about what the fuck is going on here? They're like, we are going to kill you now. Those, those are the best authoritarians. So basically the way that um, Seattle was treated, the way that Winnipeg was treated, um, and the way that a lot of people are treated now, right, is is you, you, you see these champions of democracy, these champions of Western civilization, these champions of capitalism. Um, and, you know, these workers try to ask for something better. These workers sit there and say, hey, we are trying to uh, we are trying to do the best for everybody. We want everybody to be taken care of in the best way. And you see people um, like Chris Smalls at, at the Amazon warehouse who gets fired. So what was the result of the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike? Um, the, the Central Strike Committee called off the strike to curtail the violence. 
They were basically afraid that if they continued the strike, if they continued to demonstrate peaceably, more people were going to die, more people were going to get injured, morale would end up being lost. A lot of people would, you know, essentially like they would lose family and it would turn into it, it would turn into another civil war. And, you know, they didn't they didn't want to take any kind of violent action. That's not what they were about, you know. So so again, who who the nonviolent people that didn't commit the violent in the first place were like, ah, fuck, OK, we got to call it off because these 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 children are, are, you know, throwing sticks at us and throwing stones at us and trying to fucking kill us for, for just being treated. They're, they're like, oh, you want to be treated better? Oh, we'll show you how bad we can treat you. You don't even know. You don't even know how crazy we can get. Like, just... <laughs> this is how, like, abusive partners talk. <laughs> You know, like, whenever, if you've ever been, like, a real shit relationship, which I'm so sorry if you've been a real shit relationship. Like, I've also been in real shit relationships before. Uh, and it's always just like, hey, I kind of don't like the way that you're, you're, you're treating me or, like, saying stuff to me. I feel like it's really awful and mean and rude. And, and they're like, oh, I can show you awful. Oh, just wait, because I'm going to get so awful. <laughs> That's what the government was doing. It's like, oh, you want to be treated fairly? Oh, let me show you how unfair I can get. Arrested and then killed. Boom. Suck on that, citizens. And and those are that those are those are the champions of democracy, you guys. Champions of democracy using the army to fire upon their own citizens. You know, like how a democracy works. <laughs> so after all this, seven strike leaders in Canada were arrested under uh, under conspiracy to overthrow the government. But really, I mean, what a bullshit charge because the government was overthrowing itself at that point, right? By by not standing with the people, by by basically using authoritarian tactics to prove that they weren't authoritarian. At that point, your own hypocrisies are overthrowing you. You know, like, that's all that is. And then in 1920, a year later, 11 labor candidates um, won seats, won um, uh, seats in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the parliament. Uh, and four of them were strike leaders, right? And then it was 20 years later, so 1940, 1940, until uh, Canada recognized collective bargaining. So 20 years after that strike, you know, so again, it was kind of the same thing is this was the second time that we were seeing some kind of a very large movement like this crop up. And I don't think any, any of the leaders really could predict or understand what, what the pattern of behavior was going to be in terms of like what the government was going to do. They'd kind of just came out and were like, look, let's can, maybe we can talk about it. You know, like, like a schoolyard bully, you know, like that's what, that's what I used to do for schoolyard bullies is whenever, like when I first moved to this country, like people did not understand, uh, anything about me. You know, like I wore, I wore a dress shirt and dress pants to school, you guys. And then I showed up and there was like a kid, uh, in a sleeveless shirt and just ripped up jeans. And I was just like, well, that's different. And they were, and they looked at me and they were like, well, that is something we have to kill. Uh, and I was just like, Hey, uh, I could see your shoulders. That's, that's like, that's like not a thing that I'm used to. And then they were like, we don't like your face. Um, I was like, Oh, can we talk about why you don't like my face? And they're like, no, we're just going to, uh, punch you. And that's, and that's basically how, uh, the 1919 Winnipeg government uh, treated the strikers. They didn't. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Moving to the to our second strike that we are going to discuss, uh, we're coming back to the United States, guys. Let's 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 hop let's let's hop the metaphorical plane. Uh, th this this metaphorical plane does not uh, yield in the virus. Uh, but uh, we're going to go to San Francisco, where uh, San Francisco in 1934 had a general strike. This was post um, Great Depression, right? The, the, the markets crashed and everything. 
Um, and workers, I mean, they had lost everything. Workers had lost everything at that point. They would lost their jobs. Uh, if not, they were forced to work in like terrible work conditions. You know, they were they were forced to work in awful, awful work conditions for for little or no pay um, just to have a job. Right. Just to be like, we have a job um, just for 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 that notion. Um, so today, every day uh, down in the shipyards, this this started in the shipyards. Um, workers would uh, line up at the docks and hope that they would get hired for the day. And um, they, in order to do that, in order to consistently have work, they would have to bribe the foreman or they would have to suck up to this, this guy and in, in hopes that th this person would hire them for more than just one day, right? That was kind of the hope to be like, oh, maybe I'll have like a permanent job um, instead of just being this sort of like, I have a job for today, but who the fuck knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, so everything for this starts the prior year in, in 1933, um, Matson Navigation refused to recognize, uh, the International Longshoremen Association. Uh, basically these guys were saying that you need to hire workers and you need to treat them better. And Matson Navigation was like, you're not a, you're not the boss of me. Uh, is sort of how they they reacted, like like children, uh, and they were just like you talk to the hand because the face don't want to hear it no more. Uh, and it, the International Longshoremen Association was like, hey, I don't, man, I'm just trying to talk about how to treat these workers properly. Um, and then uh, and then Matt's and Navigation took the pants off and mooned them, and they were like, I guess we're gonna have to go on strike because these people are just showing their butts to us, and that's. Uh, that's not what we want. This is so aggravating, right? So basically what this did is it showed like what they were standing up for in 1933 was the importance of unionization, what the unions were actually trying to do and why the unions are actually important. Um, so uh, they fought back. They made a national presence. And in 19, 1933, the National Industrialization Recovery Act uh, was passed in cooperation with the unions. And at this point, too, the American Federation of Labor um, was working with the ILA, the International Longshoremen Association, um, and these strikes kind of got bigger because um, FDR was on vacation and, like, didn't know what to do, right? So these strikes just started growing. So eventually this thing escalated. Um, more and more people were going on strikes because the unions weren't being treated fairly. They weren't being um, recognized to be serious. The workers were being treated terribly or they were just being put out of work they you know and they were going on these crazy work conditions being worked to the bone so in july um there there people started striking and uh and there was a a, a violent revolt uh where a bunch of strikers uh so this thing this was called bloody thursday uh, a bunch of strikers uh were attacked by the police um they killed two people they injured 70, and they and and the reason why the injury lum numbers went up, and I mean it's a miracle that m m no more than two people died. Um, it's still unfortunate, but like no more than two people died is like a huge thing. Uh, <laughs> they had clubs, tear gas, guns with live ammo, and riot guns. Uh, they call and then the and then after this happened. Um, the National Guard was called with tanks and machine guns and snipers, and the death of these two people just brought more solidarity to the strikers themselves. Uh, so then there was a funeral march. Um, and the funeral march was, was in protest of the fact that the United States brought in the National Guard, brought in the police specifically to kill workers, to attack its own citizens because their citizens were asking to be treated better. So they, they had a funeral march, um, standing in solidarity with the strikers and the desecration um, upon f about firing on workers. Um, so once again, it's 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 that same response that you, that we saw in the nineteen nineteen Winnipeg um, general strike, which which was, uh, oh you're you want you you want to see how badly we can actually treat you? Oh you oh you want to see how bad we get? Oh, I'll show you bad. 
oh, I'll show you by it. Like, that's the same. And then they, you know, killed two people, injured 70 people. Um, so July 16th, 1934, there was a call for a general strike. Uh, and here's the thing with the, the San Francisco general strike of 1934 is that this strike did not end. Um, you know, the, the, the Seattle strike ended because in six days because of uh, morale. They saw their leaders get arrested. They didn't know what to do about it. Um, so they were, they, they, they were like, okay, I guess, okay, let's, let's just go back to, to work. Uh, fine, you know, whatever. Uh, they tried to do that in Winnipeg, and Winnipeg decided to march. Um, and then, you know, eventually there was violence, uh, and they pulled out. They were like, no more violence. We don't want to see any more people die. We're, we're, we're done. Um, this thing started with violence. This thing started with, with um, uh, you know, uh, a desecration of morale. They killed workers, they tried the violence, they tried the morale decrease, and then the general strike happened, right? And, and they didn't stop until, until they were ready to meet their demands, right? They were just like, you can keep demoralizing us and you can keep trying to kill us, but we're not going to stop asking for decency and respect, for, for being compensated fairly. We're not gonna stop asking for equality, right? And that's, and that's what happened. And there was all these McCarthyist lies, um, uh, that 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 were being uh, ran around by, you know, um, by uh, the 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 newspapers. Like, and and here's the thing: San Francisco. Like, look, they they called out the troops. Troops called out here. One killed, twenty four shot. Widespread rioting is how they reported it. Widespread rioting. They don't they don't talk about the fact that the troops shot on these protesters first, right? So so the 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 narrative and. Um, the way that the, that these stories are always spun is that, oh, they're rioting. These are rioters. They're not strikers. They're just rioting animals. They're just out there to destroy capitalism with, with, their, with, with their caring and their compassion for their fellow man. How dare they? How fucking dare they? Right? So finally, um, they, tried to, they tried to do this for 15 days. And... Eventually, you know, the, the, the strikes weren't letting up. Uh, and on July 30th, 1934, the ILA and the AFL uh, ended the strike after they got collective bargaining rights. Um, so they got collective bargaining and they were like, OK, we are going to uh, we're going to pull back on this general strike. And for the entire month of, you know, for, for, for those 15 days, I mean, it really inconvenienced San Francisco citizens. Of course it did. You know, these longshoremen were not going get to get anything off of these ships. Trade and commerce was basically stopped. None of the grocery stores were getting restocked. None of the, you know, goods and services were being delivered to people. Um, and, and, you know, all these things always end up in community efforts. Like when people really need the help, like if people were like, shit, we need, we got to distribute some bread to people. We got to distribute milk to people. That's what happened in 1919. That's when all, that's when the army was brought in, uh, into play in 1919 is, is when these community programs started developing. Whenever they were like, no, we can take care of each other. Like we can work together to take care of you. We don't need these assholes to dictate how we should take care of each other. We can just do that on our own, right? Um, and really, it, what it did was, it it showed it showed the powers that be that that we dictate the economy, that we're the ones by striking have stopped the the, the flow of commerce. We control that that pipeline of, of of the economy, right? Not the government. This this thing that we're in now. Uh, if we fast forward from 1934 to today, this thing that we're now the the the, the quarantining and and the economic stimulus, the economic stimulus to people really just bailing out banks and Wall Street, that is being controlled by the government. That that economic flow is being controlled by 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 striking. You take that control away from the government, and you and you show them that no, we have been in control of this economy the whole time, and you've been lying to us about it. So. Really, in 1934, when this general strike happened, who was the one that really got scared? Rich people. <laughs> I feel like I feel like some of you guys might have known that that's the answer that was coming. Yeah, 
the rich San Franciscans, they were the ones that were really nervous about this, right? They were the ones that kind of, um, they, they convinced themselves, they convinced themselves with absolutely no proof that this was the communist revolution. Why? Because they would not be rich anymore. That's the real fear in all of this is that if employees are treated properly, if they seize the means of their own production, if everybody gets an equal chunk of the pie, if, if we all realize that, you know, in order to make society work, everybody has their own purpose. Everybody has a, a distinct um, drive and a distinct thing that they can do that they're good at. Well, why do we need hierarchy then? Well, we need hierarchy to determine who is richer than the other person, right? That a, that a manager is more important than, you know, the line worker and, 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 and the manager is not as important as the CEO or the CFO. Or anything. And it's like everybody kind of contributes to the, we're all piece, we're all pieces to the bigger puzzle. You know, we are all pieces of the gestalt. And, and this really shows us that, yeah, not we're, the, the this this notion of hierarchy is is uh, is bullshit. So finally, in 1934, um, you see a general strike work. You you see a general strike get what it needs to get. You know what did they achieve? They got union recognition. They got a 12 percent wage increase, equal share of the work, paid sick and injury leave, um, and no more bribing of the bosses. They put the Wagner Act, which protects workers and unions. Um, so this was a big deal. This was a big deal that happened. And this was the, this was a win. This was the first general strike, which, you know, in the course of the, the, the um, early 1900s, this, this is like the third one that's happened. And, and that, that, that third one yielded a victory um, that, you know, protected unions, protected workers and all that. That's a huge win. It kind of shifted the course of the conversation. It shifted like how workers were really being treated how we should be treating workers, you know, that that if you get sick, if you get injured, it's not the worker's fault. It's just sort of the course of the way that life works and they should not be penalized for it. It changed the dynamics in the co the conversation. And that and that did happen, uh, you know, not just through unions, but also through worker solidarity. Um, that's and that's really what these these strikes are about. So we saw this one example work. So. Um, to move to move to, to, to the next portion of the conversation, uh, you know, a lot of people are going to come out and they're going to criticize these strikes, especially in this current time. And there is conversation going on uh, within within the the strike community about whether we should be striking at this point or not. You know, whether we should just buck up and, and fight through and, and try to try to u levy our our strengths over to the courts. Do we do we try to, to shift the conversation on on a on a federal level? Um, do or or do we fight for solidarity in a different way? Is striking even the right thing to do in in the in the face of a global pandemic? Or is it is it the perfect time to do it because it's gonna it's gonna really show people uh, how important we are, how important the worker is, and 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 again this notion of hierarchy is not really that important. That's really another thing that, you know, the, the veil is going to be lifted off of people's eyes. So the question is, can a general strike work? Um, now, we've seen a lot more national level strikes. Um, in 2019, we saw a bunch of them. We saw a, on, on a global level, we saw a bunch of national strikes that were focused on one industry at a time, right? So uh, we saw the teacher strikes, we saw factory strikes, we saw the Yellow Vest movement, um, where even the Yellow Vest movement, I believe, was calling for a general strike in France, right? They were calling for a general strike in France. And <clears throat> really the, the question um, is like, and then, and then also to, to kind of bring it together, is the, the big general strikes we saw the ones that we've been talking about the last couple of days um, and in this video itself is all of those general strikes were focused on a city, right? So you had the 1919 Seattle general strike. You had the 1919 Winnipeg general strike. You had the 1934 San Francisco general strike. 
right? So how do we take these ideas of a, of a, a more focused national um, strike of like healthcare workers or teachers and factory workers and iron workers and all that stuff, and the whole country goes on strike with that. Um, how do we take that notion and mix it with a general strike so the whole country goes on a general strike itself? Can that even work? Can that even, how, how, would, how would we achieve something like that? Because I think if, if we're going to really shift the dynamic course of the, the, the way that economics is talked about, the way that, that human rights is applied to this, to this unfettered capitalistic system, we're going to need a complete paradigm shift. And I think if we do a general strike, it's going it's, it, I mean, to make a dent. <clears throat> so how do we combine these ideas? There, there are a few people that have talked about it. There's a couple of um, you know, sort of these pro-worker socialist papers that I have have uh, looked into, uh, which I feel like that that sentence shouldn't fucking surprise anybody. Like, if it does surprise you, they're like, what? Krish is looking into socialist stuff. Like, you have not been paying attention to any of the words I've been saying for a while. <laughs> uh so what, what people talk about, you know, or like these are professional organizers that talk about this stuff. Um, I'm, you know, my, my, my goal and purpose, I guess, is to, to look this information up um, and, and through the noise of all of this stuff is, is to find focus and, and hopefully give you guys, you know, a, a more a concentrated bite-sized way of, um, of, 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 you know, lear learning the stuff and, and, and having some levity behind it through comedy. So it, it, you know, maybe, maybe the joke will, will stick and relate back to the information. I don't, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, but, but these general strikes, the way that they describe it, operate the same way that a regular strike does. Uh, so all the rules are the same, right? Um, you, 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 you just have, you, it's just bigger is sort of the way that they do it. Uh, and one of the ways that you have to do it is you have to saturate the public with the notion of the strikes. So there are more and more, I think, independent commentators talking about the Amazon walkouts that we saw. There are more and more commentators, like, like independent commentators uh, that are on YouTube that are on my level or higher. Most of them are higher, right? Like people like Lee Camp or Ron Placone or, or Jimmy Dore, um, you know, Anya Power and Pit. Like those folks are going to talk about these general strikes because that's what we need to do. We need to put it into the zeitgeist. We need to put it into people's mind that, hey, this is something that's good. This is something that's going to work. You don't need to feel shame uh, about um, not feeling good about your employer. You don't need to feel bad about that sort of stuff. So um, more, more of us are going to talk about it, uh, more of the independent people, more of the people that are not on the mainstream network. Right, we're gonna keep talking about it, but you probably won't hear corporate media like CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, any of the any of the like mainstream candidates talk about it. You're not gonna hear Trump or Biden talk about it, or Nancy Pelosi, or fucking Chuck Schumer. They are not on the side of the common working man. They're not on the side of the middle class. They've never been on the side of the middle class. If they were, they would have given four point three. $4.3 trillion to the American people and not to the corporations, right? They would have taken a five, they would have taken that U.S. Treasury $500 billion and we can allocate it to whatever and put it into a public fund to, 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 you know, help people get groceries, help people get food, help, help cover lost wages, um, because of the current situation they're in, but they didn't, they just decided that these companies are going to do trickle down, uh, which has been a, a principle that's never fucking worked, right? That's never been a pro worker idea. That's been a pro corporate idea. Take this money and do whatever the fuck you want with it. Maybe you'll trickle it down to your people. Maybe you won't. I don't fucking know, but here it is. We gave it on the goodwill, right? So you have to keep talking about this stuff. You have to keep talking about why why it's positive what we're trying to achieve with it right and and in terms of a general strike right now um some of the major economics problems that we are seeing is that there is such a wide income gap in this country there is a major major wide income gap in this country we have we also have a health care problem in this country we have an infrastructure problem in this country um and 
what this strike would really do is go just beyond the workplace. And I think this general strike might even call out like some of the more systemic issues that we have because those systemic issues funnel right back into the workplace. So we have to keep talking about these things and put it into the forefront of all this. Um, and that's part of the next thing, right, is, is urgency. Uh, is, is how urgent is it? For a while, I think a lot of people didn't think this was that urgent. You know, oh man, Obama's in, in office, right? He's, a, he's our first black president. That's awesome. We did it. We fucking nailed it, guys. Everything's going to be fixed. And it's like, no, 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 everything's not going to be fixed. It's the same thing with Bernie. It's, it's a concern that I have if we got a Bernie Sanders presidency, that everybody would go back to that moment of complacency and just sit around and be like, Bernie's got it. Don't worry about it. We don't need to take to the streets, you guys. Let's just relax. Let's just fucking relax, you know, is we really need to, we really need to make this a ride or die moment. And, and I think we're approaching that at this point. Especially with everything that we're seeing in, in this global pandemic. You can see that. The, the system's not working. The structure's in place that, that a lot of people have given their, uh, you know, their, their faith to and everything. It's not working. They're not working anymore. Um, you know, like I mentioned, the economic divide is huge. The healthcare gap is huge. There's just tons of people that don't have health care. So even if you get, like, if we're going to talk specifically in the context of, um, of COVID, like, if you get, if you, if you feel the symptoms of it, and you, and you don't have to feel the symptoms of it to have it, right? Like, you could be asymptomatic. So, you know, you, you're asym you don't show the symptoms, but it's still there, you know? So, and then in two weeks, it's just, boom, it happens. Like, holy shit, how'd this work out? Um, if you can't get tested because the test costs $150 and you're at home and you're self-employed and you're not making a total income right now, which there's like a ton of people doing that, uh, there's, there's like over 3 million people applying for unemployment right now. So over 3 million people that just can't, can't afford the test to see if they got it. I mean, that's a healthcare crisis. On, and on top of that, we don't have enough ventilators because this is an upper respiratory disease, right? So the people that do have it that need to be taken care of need to not, need to fucking breathe. <laughs> it's kind of how a human body works. And you have corporations that are like, oh, oh, you need to breathe? Okay, how much? How much is breathing work to you? Can we put a dollar? Is it, is, is it worth $100? What about 200 Would you say breathing is worth $200 to you? Oh, it is. Oh, it, you know what? We just increased the cost of breathing to $500. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm getting notice. Yep, it's $1,000 to breathe. If you want to breathe, it's $1,000. Like that's, so that's a problem. And now we can fight for it to say that you can't do that. You can't just price gouge because you know that there's a pandemic and people need to do this kind of stuff. Complacency is the enemy of the revolution, people. Don't get too comfortable. And by no means am I saying that you shouldn't enjoy a little bit of comfort in your life, right? When things are going good, when we have a win, we can celebrate that win. You know, like certain things, certain aspects we win, but that doesn't mean that the fight's done. That means that we have to carry the work forward. The work of the revolution is never done. The work of, the work of fighting for your rights is never really done because you're always going to have these people in a power structure that, that don't want you to have that, that, that want it all for themselves. That's what, what we're really fighting is greed here. And that is a that is a very long battle. You're, we're fighting an ideal uh, an ideological battle, you know. So and that's that's a lot of that comes from from mind changing. I think what we need to get used to for a little while is that we're not gonna be in comfort for a while. If you really want things to change, if you really want things to progress, we are not gonna be comfortable for a while. We're gonna have to accept that, and we're gonna have to get com comfortable with that discomfort. What we all need to come together, okay? What, what we all need to do is we all need to come in solidarity with each other, right? Is, is because it's very easy to divide us. Um, and what we all need to realize is that we're all victims of the elites. That's what we are. You know, we're, we're all victims of those bosses, right? Like that's, that's how most corporate things operate is you got to suck up to the boss. You got you to gotta bribe them, you know? It's like, oh, look, I bought you candies. <laughs> Don't fire me, <laughs> please. You know, like... 
blue collar workers, white collar workers, low middle income, all races, creeds and identities. We're all part of the middle class, the newly employed and even the retired. The retired now depend on uh, on on these bosses, too, right, because their 401ks are tied into the market. And if the market's not saved, then there goes their retirement, you know, so. So we're all connected. We're all we're all tied together. The other thing that we need to um, really focus on, other than you know the the urgency and the solidarity aspect of it, to make the, to to get people to be on the side of this general strike, this this national general strike that might need to happen, is the morale of the worker. We have to overcome this no this this fear and discomfort. Okay, and here's the thing: most of us are living in discomfort. Most of us don't, you know. Ha like we we just don't have all the comforts that we probably should right there's that notion in capitalism that if you work a full-time job you shouldn't be in poverty that's why people believe in capitalism that's why people want to well that, that's how, that's why they, they 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 fight for it so much they champion for it they go well if i believe in the system and i work really hard i won't be poor but here we are we're seeing people that that uh, that work two three jobs that you know have an internship that bust their balls all fucking day to make pittance and now the the only thing the government can give us to help us out when we've been making a bunch of rich people a shit ton of money is 1200 bucks one time that's that's fucking crazy right so if we've been living in discomfort and if we want to um, not live in discomfort anymore yeah we're going to have to do a couple more things that are probably going to be a little bit little more uncomfortable We can't keep playing by the games of the system anymore. And here's here's the reality, right? This is this is the big morale booster here. We fucking won before. We've won because of unions, because of the labor movement, because of the workers' parties. That's that's how we won by by being in solidarity with each other. That's how San Francisco won. What when did when did you really see uh, the elites start getting really really nervous in Seattle? When did you see the elites getting really, really nervous in in Winnipeg when people banded together and they started working with each other, that when they started believing that these that these the, the, these working class union leaders, because the, the union leaders aren't, you know, a, especially in those days, weren't really like rich people. They weren't they weren't some kind of oligarchs. They were people that were probably standing in the fucking the worker line right next to you. That guy was probably a union leader. You know, so this would be somebody sitting in the cubicle next to you. That's probably your union leader right there. That's how it should be anyway, I think. That's that's part of the reason why why they were doing so well. It's because these common people that understood the struggle because they were in the struggle themselves. They were running for it. And, that, and so they, they work for, uh, you know, for, for better working conditions. They work for, they, they pushed for weekends. They pushed for the overtime pay. They pushed for 40-hour work weeks. So... We've won before. We have all of these things because we believed in the, in the solidarity of the Labor Party, because we believed in the solidarity of the working class people, and we fought for these things. We stayed in that discomfort. So now what we're doing is, is we're fighting to close these loopholes, right? Because there are loopholes. So two jobs circumvent all of these things like having to in the, the need for two jobs and stagnating wages um circumvents the notion of uh of a 40-hour work week uh of overtime pay and really also weekends like most people don't i don't i don't know if a lot of people really have weekends anymore like i I'm, and this is by my own design but you know like i work every single day <laughs> I like to take my leisure time every, you know, I like to go outside and take a walk and, you know, do some exercising here and there, watch a little Star Trek every once, you know, but I, and I dictate my own schedule, but I mean, I work seven days a week. It's a pretty constant work schedule to put out videos and be creative and do my writing and do video, do, do, do video editing, audio editing, you know, and put out my own content. But there's other people that work two jobs. I mean, they're going over 40 hours a week. Some people are working 60 to 80 hours a week, multiple part-time jobs. That circumvents all of it. They're not getting overtime pay. They're getting paid regular hours. That's not, that's not what the labor movement fought for. So now we're trying to close these loopholes. But we won before, so let's look at how we won and apply it to now, right?
And we're and and no more of this. Let's keep working for the weekend bullshit. Okay, we're not working for the weekend anymore. We're working to create a better future. That's what that I'm I'm rewriting the fucking song. <laughs> we're working for a better. Fe- I'll work on a tune. I'll I'll figure out a tune for it. You know, if, so, if somebody write a guitar tune, uh, D minor, do it in D minor. Get get me a drop D. Is that a thing? I heard about that. Is drop D. Do it in drop D, and and we'll write working for a better future, uh, and 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 make that a, a theme song. <laughs> And here's the key, right? Because a lot of people are going to come out and be like, this is not the time for it, Krish. Right? We talked about this a little bit. But this is not the time for it. This is a pandemic. This is not the time for worker solidarity. This is time for people to band together and do the right thing. Da, 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 da. Uh, well, okay, I get it. This is already a tough time. And asking people to go on strike um, to fight for this cause is going to create a little distress, right? Like, how are people going to eat? How are people going to afford their, their rents and all that stuff? It's like, again, we're struggling with that as it is. And that's what we're fighting against. We're fighting to not constantly be in a state of struggle all the time. But how did the strikers in 1919 do it? How did the strikers in 1934 do it? How did the Black Panthers do it? Community organization. They did it because the communities got together. They did it because you had a bunch of people that were like, you know what, we gotta feed these strikers. We gotta take care of these, the, the garbage problem. And we're already doing it in this, in this situation. I have, I have a bunch of people, uh, uh, one particular, his name's Pierre Bichon. He's a very funny comedian in, in Vermont. Um, he's going out delivering groceries to, to, to families and elderly people, you know, wearing gloves and a mask and he's out there um, you know, delivering uh, groceries and, 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 and things that people need every single day. I, wa- I, I watch him do it. You know, that's amazing. We're already doing it. We just need to take it to the next level, um, and, you know, uh, to, to, to show that, that we can run our own communities, that, that the powers that be don't actually control us. If this is a government represented by the people and for the people, then it should be, and here's how we're going to do it. We're gonna we're gonna show you how we're gonna how how to actually run a, a government for the people and by the people, right? Land, landlords are cutting rent. There there are certain landlords that are like, don't worry about the rent. Fuck it. <laughs> Everybody's kind of in a, in a tough time. If you even if you there there was something I saw the other day where um, even if you have the money, hold on to it, um, and you know later down the line maybe we can do something about it. But right now, fucking take care of yourself. Right. You have food banks, you have all of these community based programs that now we can push ourselves into. Now we can start supporting those community efforts because those community efforts become very, very important. Uh, And this this right here, this community effort that, you know, like the Black Panthers survival programs, uh, what happened in 1919, uh, you know, the solidarity when when all of their efforts fail, that's when that retaliation shows up. The community efforts really does spark a lot of it, right? It sparks a lot of it um, because it really shows the powers that be that we don't fucking need them. And they're scared because they don't really have any usable skill. Like, I don't think Chuck Schumer knows how to build a table. You know, like, I'm pretty sure he has, like, an intern or a boy to do it. You know, like I think I feel like Chuck Schumer is is the kind of person that still says boy a lot, you know, and it's just like, what do I have? What if you put a screwdriver in Chuck Schumer's hand? I think he might have a panic attack and a coronary heart attack, but it's fine. He'll be fine. He has a Cadillac health insurance. He'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You guys don't worry about it. But that's when they freak out. And they have to hold on to that to be like, well, we've already convinced these other people that that they have to help us, and by helping us is how we're helping th- that that they're getting help themselves. So so if if they just start helping each other, then what about me? Where 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 do I fit into this community? And and they don't really have a purpose because their purpose has become um, uh, exploiting their exploiting power is essentially what it is. It, is it's just them become coming to this point of power and then just staying in that point of power without doing anything with that power like there's no benevolency with their power 
and by going into community standards, we're just showing that we can be benevolent towards each other because everybody now is part of that power structure. It's not, it's not just one person is running that power structure. It's everybody in the community has to do their part uh, to run this community efficiently. We've changed the dynamics of, of what power is, and that freaks them out because that's all they're good at. They're just good at, at exploiting people. <laughs> like they're not good at anything else. And, that, and, and if you think I'm wrong, uh, show me a picture of Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Joe Biden, or Donald Trump putting together an Ikea fucking table. And I, and, that, and, and I will say that I might be wrong. Maybe I'm wrong if I can see that. Standing together means that we get the future that we want. It means that we can actually get to progress. That's, that's what it really means, right? And that's what these community efforts would mean. That's what this general strike would achieve. So again, you know, to kind of recap what, what, it, what, what, what we need to do to make these general strikes work is one, we have to keep talking about what it is and why it's important. It, we, we have to keep talking about these things, right? What our quote unquote list of demands would be. And, and I, I do think that it goes beyond the workplace in, in terms of a, a national general strike. It would, ha it would have to go into health, like getting, getting better health care, um, closing that income gap, making sure that, um, that, that rich people are tech, making sure that um, we're not losing our social programs. Um, why is health care uh, something that's more about profit than it is about health? Why is education um, more about profit than it is about knowledge? These sort of things are all should be part of our, our, our list of demands. And then the urgency of it. Um, why we need that as soon as possible, right? It's the same thing as the, wor the workers did in 1934. It's why do we need this as soon as possible? Well, people are, are, are dying. <laughs> like, that's really what it is. People are fucking dying, right? So the urgency of it, it's ride or die. Um, and then solidarity comes in to play as well, right? We're all in it together. It can't just be that uh, this this is... This one aspect is important than the other aspect. We all have a part to play in our community. We all have a purpose in our community. We all need to come together and fight for each other in our community. So, so that might even mean that if, if we create that one big union, right? We, we talked about the one big union earlier in this video. Um, if we have that one big union and then underneath that you have the, the metal workers union, you have the healthcare union, the teacher union, the artist union, there should be a representative of every other union part of all of these specific unions, right? So that way, like, we're, we're all talking to each other. We all understand what the other person needs, and we, we, we can be on a little bit more of an equal footing. It's more about uh, the purpose that you, that you serve to the community rather than the hierarchy in which you serve within the community. Uh, then it comes about morale. Uh, it's about knowing that we can win, you know? A bunch of people in the beginning in Seattle were arrested. That killed the morale. That killed the movement. Well, it didn't work in, in Winnipeg. <laughs> and that's just a few months, right? These people took to the streets. Uh, then there was violence. That, that kind of hit the morale a little bit harder. Well, that didn't work in Seattle. It didn't work with the Panthers either. It didn't work with the Black Panthers either. It didn't work with a couple different movements where, where they were violent towards them. And it was just like, all right, we're going to keep escalating it. So, and it's also remembering that we've won before, you know, uh, and then being organized as a community, making sure that we're all taking care of each other. So if somebody needs something from another person to be like, yeah, I got your back. I got your back. Don't worry about it. We're going to make it work. We're going to make this happen. This is, uh, I'm, I'm stealing this quote from, uh, <laughs> from somebody here. Um, but I, I think that it is an important quote, um, and uh, I'm going to get the Sarah Nelson. Uh, Sarah Nelson is part, pardon my delay. I should have probably prepared for this. She's a, she's a flight attendant union leader, Sarah Nelson. Um, and this is what she, this is, I think a very important thing to keep in mind. Um, and, uh, I'm giving credit where credit is due. Sarah Nelson, flight attendant, union worker, uh, union leader, sorry. Um, she, she says this, and I think this is kind of the, the important aspect of this. The strike is our tactic. Solidarity is our power. That's really big. Um, because yeah, that's the, that's the method of how we are going to achieve our change, but solidarity is the power behind our change.
shifting that dynamic of of um, of our leadership, shifting the dynamic of taking care of each other and what what it really means to be a functioning society. That comes from solidarity. That comes from our support from each other. So um, that's very important. So again, the strike is our tactic. Solidarity is our power. That concludes our Philosophy Friday, everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed that. We talked about, uh, I know, I know I'm know i going to keep talking about these strikes for a little bit longer. Uh, I hope you're not sick of them. Because <laughs> I'm not. I am. I'm actually, I'm, I'm having a really good time learning about this stuff. Um, it's really cool to see like where we won, what we did. I, I, I really like that aspect of it. So I, I hope you guys are too. I think what I'm going to do is uh, for the next couple of days, one of the chunks that I do, one of the segments that I do um, is going to be about a strike. I have a couple of them pulled up um, and uh, I'm already working on, on the Black Panthers piece that talks a lot, that is going to end up talking more about this community organization idea. Um, I'm, you know, and I think a lot of the strike information is going to wind up in the Dem exit third party, uh, a, a, you know, piece that I'm, that I'm kicking around as well, uh, that hopefully I'll be able to get, get out in the next week or two. Uh, that's my goal. That's my plan. Um, I'm hoping that I don't get laid out by another fucking migraine or something like that. Um, so yeah, stay, stay tuned for all of that. Uh, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe this video, especially if you enjoy content like this. Uh, I'm going to be putting them up every day except for Thursdays, like I mentioned before. Um, is Thursday, I'm going to take the day off to, to try to focus on writing, um, try to focus more on Taboo Table Talk and putting that podcast out, um, and try to take care of some miscellaneous work as well. Um, Got to do some of that tonight. Uh, that's That's kind of the plan. Um, but, uh, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in and, oh, if you want to, if you, if you have the means to, and you can donate, you can go to my, uh, donation page on my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. Um, you, that, that shows you different ways you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation. Of course, it is not an absolute necessity that you do that. Um, it is a extra token of appreciation if you weren't able to, and I know everybody's in a tough time. So I'm putting out these videos for free. They're available on my YouTube page. They're available on my Facebook page and audio podcast versions as well. So, uh, however your method of enjoying content like this, um, you know, they'll be, they'll be available. So, um, I'm also continuing to kick around the idea of how to run a live stand up comedy show via zoom. Um, I'll probably, maybe figure out a format for it in the next couple of days, um, post up a, a, a link for a test show with limited audience and try to kind of figure it out and then, uh, and then find a date where, um, you know, I, I do the, I do the real thing, the full blown thing. Um, and I, and I have an idea for a format when I was laid out with a migraine yesterday, that was one of the things I think I kind of came up with. I might have an idea of how to do it. Um, and, and kind of segment it, um, to do, to do it, uh, a little differently than I would if I was, you know, standing in front of you in a stage where I could look at you in your eyeballs and stuff. Uh, but <laughs> I hope everybody is, is doing well out there. I hope everybody is, uh, is safe. Um, Hey, look, you guys should definitely leave a comment and stuff on these videos because I do see them. I do comment back whenever I do the premieres. Um, um, so yeah, leave a comment. I'm I'm gonna be watching the replay to to hang out with you guys for a little while, uh, and then oh, tomorrow is storytelling Saturday, and Sunday I'm gonna be live. Uh, every every Sunday I'm going live, so make sure you guys are tuned into that. Make sure you guys are are, are staying up to speed on all of that stuff. Um, tomorrow I've got, I think I got a fun I think I have a fun story to tell you guys. So uh, I think that's everything. Yeah, I think that's everything. Till tomorrow, guys. Till tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for liking, sharing. Thank you to all the people that are donating. Uh, I love you guys. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon.